Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to join our World Health Report Asian Lunch um, online events. Well, um, we're going to spend one hour here um, to introduce uh, the main content of this year's World Health Report. We also invite two panelists to discuss some specific area related with the happiness in Asia. Well, um, first, let me give you a brief introduction about myself. And my name is Xun Wang. I'm a currently a senior associate professor at Xian Jiao Tong Liverpool University based in Suzhou, China. I'm an editor uh, of the World Health Report and also a founding member of the report. I've been working for, with this report since the very beginning and mainly on the global ranking of uh, the happiness by countries. Well, um, first I'll give you a brief introduction about World Health Report and then I'll introduce the, um, our uh, speakers today. Uh, well, the history of the World Health Report can date back to um, early uh, 2011. In that year, the UN General Assembly adopted a, re a resolution called Unhappiness towards a holistic definition of development, which invites member countries to measure happiness of their people and to use the data to help guide public policies. While in the next year, um, this was followed by the first UN high-level meeting called Wellbeing and Happiness, defining um, a new economic paradigm, which was chaired by the UN General uh, Secretary General Pan Ki-moon and the Prime Minister of Bhutan. Well, the first World Health Report were released as the foundational test, tax test for this UN high-level meeting uh, on April 1st, 2012. Well, this report aimed to contain a collection of articles on the global and regional distribution of happiness, the determinant of happiness, and policy uh, implications. Well, the funding editors include John Halliwell from UBC, Richard Laird from London School of Economics and Politics, and Jeffrey Sachs from Columbia University. Well, um, later, the, the United Nations General Assembly decided to proclaim March 20th as the International Day of Happiness. So since then, almost every year, we will um, produce and release this World Health Report. Well, now the current editor, uh, editorial team includes John Halliwell, Richard Laird, Jeffrey Sachs, and also new members, uh, including uh, Yan Dinier from uh, University of Oxford, and Lara Ackling from Samuel, University, uh, Samuel Fraser University, and also me. Well, um, this year's World Health Report, we pay a special attention to different age groups in particular the old people and also the young people. And you can see a couple of chapters are discussing uh, different issues related with the age or the happiness of different age groups. Um, so today, in addition to my talk on the global ranking, we'll also invite um, some other uh, authors of the chapter to talk about um, specific topics. And uh, so uh, first one will be Dr. Wang Zhou from uh, a research fellow at the Wellbeing Research Center at the University of Oxford. She obtained her PhD from the University of Cambridge and a master from University of Pennsylvania and uh, a bachelor degree from University of Minnesota. Her research focuses on the understanding and improving well-being with a particular emphasis on child and excellent mental health and well-being, social emotional skills and cross-cultural studies. And she she's, uh, sits on the editorial board of many journals, including Journal of Youth and Excellence and Frontiers in Education. Our uh, next speaker will talk about the, um, the um, uh, happiness of the older, uh, older adults in India. The speaker is uh, Dr. Um, Shobit Srivas Tava. And he's a demographer with a master and a PhD in population studies from the International Institute for Population Sciences, Mumbai, India. His expertise lies mainly in analyzing the large data sets and over, um, uh, he has published over 150 research papers in the international peer reviewed journals uh, in a domain like uh, general ontology uh, and nutrition and gender. And he served as a monitoring and evaluation expert at an international NGO. And we have um, uh, two panelists today. Um, uh, the first one is William Top from um, Singapore Management University. And he completed his doctoral in social and personality psychology at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. His research focused on the um, multi-level process at, uh, that underlies well-being 
at a macro level, his interest in cultural similarities and differences in well-being, as well as the social level conditions associated with our well-being. At the micro level, he examines daily fluctuations in emotion, satisfaction, and meaning, and how those fluctuations may be influenced by personal pers uh, personality, memory, and social interactions. He currently serves as a co-deputy uh, director of the Center for Research on Successful Aging, which manages the Singapore Left Panel. And um, our another panelist is Arthur uh, Graham, who is a professor of well-being and public policy at Victoria, the University of Wellington's School of Government. And he's also a senior fellow at Motu Economic and Public Policy Research. He co-convened uh, co the World Wellbeing Panel. In 2023, he was awarded the title of the Research Fellow on the International Society of, for Quality of Life Studies. Professor Graham, the primary role included chairman, uh, prior role included chairman and chief economist at the Reserve Bank of New Zealand and the president of the New Zealand Association of Economists. I'm very happy to have them on board to talk about uh, different issues regarding uh, happiness and well being. So now I will hand the stage to um, Barry Graham to show the video, play a video from John Clifton of the CEO of the Gallup Organization, who is a major data provider of our World Health Report. What is the happiest place on earth? Thanks to the World Happiness Report, we now know the answer. And thanks to Oxford University and the United Nations, this work has become famous. But what many don't know is that the voices behind it come from a global study conducted by Gallup. Our interest in happiness traces back many decades. Our founder, George Gallup, is best known as the pioneer of modern polling and the inventor of presidential approval ratings. But his insatiable curiosity took him beyond the political realm. In an interview with the esteemed journalist Edward R. Murrow in the 1950s, Dr. Gallup was asked, of everything that you've studied, what is it that interests you the most? His answer, happiness. We've since put booster rockets on his original work and began studying happiness, well-being, and the essence of a great life across 140 countries. And to date, Gallup has surveyed more than 3 million adults in over 168 countries using more than 150 languages. Understanding the statistical landscape of life on Earth serves a critical purpose beyond mere curiosity. The absence of such data can have dire implications. Effective policymaking relies on solid data, yet there remains a significant lack of it in various parts of the world. Many of the existing global indicators, like GDP, only capture the economic dimensions of life, if at all. Today's World Happiness Report attempts to bridge some of these gaps by offering insights into people's perceptions of life on Earth. It offers more than just national rankings. It provides analytics and advice for evidence-based planning and policymaking. Our role in research on world happiness is a natural fit with our longstanding mission, providing leaders with the right information about what people say makes life worthwhile. All right, um, so um, I will talk about the chapter two of the World Health Report. And in this chapter, we usually report the global rankings with some special focus in this year on the different age groups. So the title of this um, year's um, chapter two is Happiness of the Younger, the Older, and Those in Between. So uh, I'll briefly introduce the global rankings um, and then touch on some special topic on the age issues. Well, the content is mainly based on the chapter two of the World Health Report, are written by John Hallowell, Haifang Huang, and Hugh Shippet, and, and me. Well, um, the happy rankings are based on individuals' own assessment of their lives. In particular, their answers to the single item country ladder life evaluation question on a scale zero to 10. Why, why I put this in the very beginning, because there are always, in the past years, there are many reports which just misunderstood uh, our happiness score. They said we just use some factors to construct some happiness indicator or happiness index. Actually, no. 
we just use the survey questions, which are based on country or letter, and we just uh, simply average the data um, for the recent three years data. So we do not construct index, we just use the survey data. Well, this year report showed that there's a lot of year-to-year -year consistency in the way people read their lives in different countries, because we can see that the top ranking countries are very similar to those in last year or the year before. Well, since our data are based on the recent three years averages, that's why we can see those kind of consistency. Well, we find that while the top 10 countries remain largely unchanged, there has been much more action in the top 20. That means there are some changes uh, among the top 20 countries. For example, the United States uh, just um, dropped from the top 20 countries. Well, this is the this year ranking. Well, Finland still take the top spot, followed by Denmark, Iceland, Sweden, Israel, and a couple of countries uh, in Northern Europe. In Northern Europe. Well, um, and we, we, we can see that actually um, there is no Asian country in this top 20 list, well, unfortunately. However, uh, we do have one um, on the top, uh, that's in Singapore. Singapore has been ranking uh, the ha most happiest country in Asia for the last two uh, years. Well, this year, uh, Singapore is ranked um, 30th with a score 6.5. It's not a bad one. However, it's still uh, a little lower than the very top sports such as Finland, which have a score 7.741 over 10. That's quite a high score, uh, Singapore and um, still have a long way to go to catch up with the uh, most happiest country in the world. And another one uh, in Asia, the second one in Asia is Taiwan province of China, which is just uh, very close to Singapore. Um, before 2023, um, Taiwan has been among the, on the top in Asia, but now um, Singapore takes take their spot. Well, some other Asian countries followed by like, um, Uzbekistan um, ranked number 47, and Kazakhstan ranked number 49, then followed by Japan and Korea. Actually, Japan and Korea are more advanced in terms of their income level or GDP per capita than um, like, uh, you know, the Central Asian countries. However, their happiness levels are not that uh, high. Well, where's China? Uh, China is num uh, number 60. And its score is very similar to Thailand's, just a slightly smaller than Thailand's. Uh, well, in the past, China was not as good as today, but uh, in recent years, its happy score has been increased a lot. That's why its ranking also uh, increased. Well, um, these are the rankings on the top. We can also see the most, uh, the least happiest country in the world. The, the bottom one is Afghanistan, then Lebanon, uh, Lesono, and uh, Sierra Leone, you know, those, the least uh, developed countries in the world. And also many countries of them are just um, facing some conflicts or wars there. Well, in addition to the uh, global rankings, which catch a lot of eyeballs, um, well, we can see that, um, we also show that the ranking differ a lot for the young and the old because there are so many details there I cannot show you here. Um, but uh, we can briefly talk about some countries in Asia. For example, in the case of China, the overall ranking is 60. However, uh, the, uh, the young people's ranking is much higher than that. Uh, sorry, much lower than that. But the old people have a much better ranking in China. Well, if you look at the dynamics uh, of the rankings, we also see that the negative emotions in this year are more frequent than before. So that means there is a global rising in you know, worry and concerns. And that global happiness inequality have also been increased uh, a lot in the past uh, uh, years. Well, uh, look at the changes of happiness. We can see that um, a lot of gainers here. In the, if you compare uh, recent years um, with 2006 to 2008, like Serbia, Bulgaria, Lat uh, you know, Latvia, and uh, Romania, and also China, it gains a lot. However, some other countries like Afghanistan, Lebanon, and Jordan, they have, uh, have uh, seen a large decrease in their happiness. Well, given the time limit, I cannot talk too much details of there, but I would like to show the last slide regarding the, 
dynamics of happiness in a, a few uh, country and nations in Asia. We can see that in India. We, I want to say that in India, actually, there are a lot of decrease in recent years up to uh, you know uh, the 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 COVID nineteen um, pandemic period. But some other countries like Indonesia, Philippines, and China, and generally uh, seeing the increase in the happiness in the recent decade. Okay, um, so that's a very brief introduction to the uh, global rankings chapter. If you got more interest, please go to our website worldhappiness.report and to find more details. I'll hand the stage to uh, another co-author uh, uh, of the chapter authors. Okay, over to you, Wayne. Uh, thanks, Chad. I am sharing my screen now. Uh, it's my pleasure to present this chapter, Child and Adolescent Wellbeing, Global Trends, Challenges, and Opportunity, on behalf of my impressive co-authors, Jose, Laura, Leonie, and Ian. Um, we also want to use this opportunity to thank data providers and everyone else who provide feedback and support. Our chapter is the third chapter of this year's What Happiness Report. Before I dive into the content of this chapter, um, I want to first emphasize that we only analyze adolescence data within the age ranging from 10 to 24, and we focused on child and adolescence subjective well-being, which is how young people perceive and assess their own lives. Finally, all the tables and figures I used in this presentation are from our own chapter. Uh, my presentation starts from chapter overview, then move to overall findings, key insights, then ends with call to action. Um, a little bit on chapter overview. Our chapter aims to present a comprehensive analysis of child and adolescent subjective well-being, acknowledging the challenges posed by data limitations. We used the four major cross-sectional data sets. Um, they are Program for International Student Assessment, PISA Survey, the Health Behavior in School Aged Children, HBSC Survey, the International Survey of Children's Wellbeing, known as Children's Word, and the Gallup Word Pool. Um, if you're interested in these surveys, the illustration on the left can be found in our chapter, and it includes the details about all these different data sets. If I want to use one sentence to conclude this chapter, that is life satisfaction levels, Trends and correlations vary across age, gender, what regions, countries, and the levels of economic development. And the first findings that I want to share is that from Gallup data, um, we found that globally, adolescents age 15 to 15 to 24, if you see the green line on the right, um, report significantly higher life satisfaction than adults aged 25 or above, if you see the purple line. So in another word, life satisfaction gradually drops from childhood through adolescence into adulthood. Moving to the second key insight, um, we find that female adolescents start to report lower life satisfaction than male adolescents at around age 12, and the gap further expands between age 13 to 15. And later at age 15 to 24, we find females report higher life satisfaction than males when consider almost all countries. However, the first conclusion is based on, if you see the, the chart on the left, four regions of the world, they are Western Europe, Commonwealth of Independent States, Central and Eastern Europe, and Canada only. So we don't know whether the first conclusion can be generalized to other regions of the world, for example, Asia. That's this lead to our next insight, data limitations. If we see the table on the right, um, you can find that availabilities of Asian uh, data availabilities among Asian countries and regions is very limited. 
um, two primary shortcomings were reviewed in the current existing international data set of child and adolescent well-being. The first is um, data in early to middle adolescents, age 10 to 15, it's only available in high and upper middle income countries. Secondly, there is a absence of a standardized measurement of well-being. That's there is a global need for improving, improving data collection and assessment to enhance child and adolescent well-being. And we believe the following three suggestions can be the potential next step um, to help this process. Um, first, for collecting international adolescents and child data, um, we need at least one standardized measurement of subject well-being. Secondly, there is a need for a broader age coverage from age eight to late adolescence and into adulthood. Certainly we need more data from different regions and the special attention should be put on improving data collection in middle and low income countries. Here comes to the end of the presentation. I have only covered some key insights within our chapter and I highly recommend people who are interested in this topic to take a closer look of this chapter and the report itself. Thank you. Can you stop sharing, Mayin? Uh, sorry. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I will pass the word to the host. Okay, Shabit, please share your screen. Yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon from India. and. This is Shobit, and I will be presenting the chapter Differences in Life Satisfaction Among Older Adults in India. And firstly, I want to thank all my co-authors, Ronak, Mansi Pai, and Mohammed, to significantly contribute in the chapter. Firstly, coming on to the significance of the uh, uh, chapter, so India or India's older population is second largest worldwide with 140 million Indian aged 60 and over, which is approximately 9% of the total population as per census 2011. Uh, the average growth rate of India's aged 60 and above is three times higher than the country's overall population growth rate. While percentages of older adults may be much more in countries like South Korea and Japan, but the numbers are very huge in India. If I talk about the uh, what does the study add, the study aimed to find out the significant factors that contribute to the differences in the life satisfaction among older adults in India, and also what factors actually contribute for the variation in the uh, overall life satisfaction score among older adults is the uh, main objective of the chapter. Now, coming on to the data and methods. so. Uh, uh, we have used la a longitudinal aging study in India, LASI, which was conducted in 2017-19. It is a sister study of HRS. Uh, largely, the data collected in the LASI is uh, on demographic data, uh, the data related to health symptoms, conditions, disabilities, etc. The overall sample size of the data was 73,396 for the people aged 45 years and above. However, for the current analysis, we have considered only the population of 60 years and above, which is about 30,795 uh, old adults as a sample. Coming on to the outcome variable, so our outcome variable it was life satisfaction, which was, uh, which was measured using five questions, each question having scale of one to five. So we are, we, we ha after having a composite score, we had a scale of five to 35. However, to uh, compare it, with the global estimates, we have uh, reanalyzed the uh, overall score and we, we we actually made it from zero to 10. And the overall life, life satisfaction score on the scale of zero to 10 was 6.32 for older adults aged 60 and above using our LASI data set. Uh, 
Uh, coming on to the statistical methods, we have used unweighted percentage distribution, bivariate analysis, one-way ANOVA, multivariate, uh, multivariable linear regression analysis, and dominance analysis, which actually helped us in knowing the what is the what what were the factors that actually contributed in the variation of life satisfaction score. So these are the overall demographic characteristics. I will just talk briefly about the health characteristics. About 25% of the older adults aged 60 and above were having multiple chronic disease. About 6.8% uh, were uh, had uh, had a depression. About 22% reported that their uh, health was poor. About 20% reported difficulty in activities of daily, daily living. About 43% reported difficulty in instrumental activities of daily living and about 74% of the older adults were physically inactive. Talking about the data and methods, so uh, the main findings I would like to uh, sh uh, show over was the figure 5.2, which actually talks about contribution of independent variables to overall variation in life satisfaction among older adults in India. So. The variation was largely explained by living arrangement satisfaction among older adults, uh, followed by self-rated health. Uh, uh, if they have uh, followed by discrimination um, in among older adults, followed by their level of education, and followed by their uh, their uh, importance to religion. So these were the top five factors which actually. Uh, explain most of the variation in the life satisfaction score among older adults. So this can be uh, quoted as one of the most important findings from our study. Apart from the apart, apart, apart from that, uh, the regression analysis shows that the oldest old reported a significantly greater likelihood of life satisfaction than their peers, that is young, old, and old, old. And uh, older women, were having uh, a greater life satisfaction. Uh, the odds were high in comparison to men. That was the uh, quite important finding from our study. Moreover, individuals who reported satisfaction with their current living arrangement, who did not experience ill treatment or discrimination, who were not depressed, and who rated their health as good, were having significantly higher likelihoods of having a higher life satisfaction score in comparison to their uh, counterparts. Now coming on to the conclusion, the present study substantially contributes to the literature on later life subjective well-being in India. And we do so by employing a sizable heterogeneous nationally representative sample of older Indians. We found that older women, those in the higher age groups currently married and those who were educated reported higher life satisfaction than their counterparts. Lower, sites, uh, lower satisfaction with the living arrangement, perceived discrimination, and poor self-rated health were important factors associated with the low satisfaction, life satisfaction score among older Indians. Findings of this study indicates that strengthening family networks to ensure a comfortable living arrangement for older adults, men, widowed, and those without a formal education in particular, and fostering social networks to reduce discrimination may enhance the overall well-being and nice satisfaction among older adults. That is all from my side, and the in-depth uh, findings can be found in our chapter. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Um, so now it's our, um, we've got some comments and feedbacks from our um, two panelists. So William, please. Please turn down, please turn down your audio and also share the screen, please. Okay. Uh, well, I, I just, I don't have slides uh, regarding my comments, but uh... I thought the the finding was uh, very interesting for both presentations, actually, and uh, how you see the trends going up and down in different life stages. So, uh, you know, going well being going down in adolescence, then sort of like peaking back up um, for women uh, in their twenties, and and then in India, just seeing the different predictors of well being among the older adults. Um, I don't know if you know Shobit, but I'm just curious, what is the the typical living arrangement for for older adults in India? 
Um, you know, is it mainly they are married? How many of them are living alone? Um, is that unusual? Because, you know, that's something that um, we are concerned a lot about in Singapore, um, you know, older adults who, who are living alone. Um, and it, it does seem to be an important factor. And so it's very interesting to see that actually gets highlighted as a, as a major predictor of well-being in your data. And so Shobik, would you would you happen to know like what, what is the, the typical living arrangements in, in India? So uh, the typical living arrangement in India was largely like I did even I did my PhD looking at the living arrangement and we see that a major, I mean almost seven to eight percent of the older adults were living as a loan. And that 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 was the interesting finding we had from India, and the proportion is actually increasing also. Those people, older adults who are living alone, especially in urban areas. Yeah. So, so well, um, um uh, regarding your own topic, you, uh, do you want to share this share the slide? Sure. Yes. Please maximize the uh, the screen. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, it's it's uh it's it's great to hear uh the presentations and and happy to present. Uh, so I'm a researcher based in Singapore, and that's the population that I focus on. And today I'm just going to share very briefly some work that we're doing on well-being in older adults in Singapore. We do this using the Singapore Life Panel, which I'll say a little bit more in a bit. Uh, but just before I get into that, uh, provide some context for um, what I want to look at and, and talk about in my presentation, which is the stability of, of life satisfaction in older adults in Singapore and, and how much can it change or how much can we expect it to change? Why is that important? Well, in Singapore and, and all across Asia, um, you know, the these countries are aging pretty rapidly. So this graph is just showing the proportion of the population age 60 and above in uh, several Asian countries. And if you see the dotted lines, you can see Europe and, and the USA for comparison. Um, and the general story is that Asian countries are aging more rapidly than, than in the West. Uh, looking specifically in Singapore, about 19% of the population is 65 and above. Uh, this is what demographers would say is an aged society. And by 2026, Singapore is projected to become a super aged society, which means over 21% of the population is going to be uh, 65 years or older. Uh, life expectancy has increased in Singapore and other Asian countries. So from 1990 to 2019, for example, uh, life expectancy increased by 10 years. But if we look at health adjusted life expectancy or HAIL, uh, you can see that it still lags behind. So uh, there's about a 10 year uh, gap between how long people are living and how many of those years are lived in good health and happiness. So that's one of the reasons why it's so important to monitor well-being in older adults is because if we are interested in extending health adjusted life expectancy so that people are living their final years with a better quality of life, uh, yes, we wanna look at physical health, but we also wanna look at their mental health and their subjective well-being. Um, but all of that is based on the premise that uh, you can change well-being. Uh, and so one of the things that we are interested in looking at with our data is, is actually estimating how much of subjective well-being is amenable to change in older adults. So we do this um, using the Singapore Life Panel, which is uh, managed by the Center for Research on Successful Aging. And it's a monthly survey of about 7,000 respondents they were 50 to 70 when they were originally recruited. Now they're 50. I mean, many of them are, are uh, in their 60s and 70s. 
Uh, and they answer questions each month. Uh, most of them are using the internet. We ask them questions about their well-being, their social behavior, uh, financial situation, um, lots of, of, of different uh, lifestyle and life circumstance um, questions. And one of the questions that we ask is a, a fairly standard life satisfaction question, uh, which they rate on a five-point scale. And you can see this graph is just plotting average level of life satisfaction in the sample from 2016 to 2023. Um, there's a little bit of a dip you'll notice in 2020 because of uh, COVID. But on average, uh, life satisfaction is above the midpoint of the scale. It's a five-point scale. So 3.5 to 3.46 um, generally means that Singaporean older adults in our sample are at least you know, somewhat satisfied with their lives. Uh, standard deviation is about uh, 0.7 to 0.8. Um, so there's quite a bit of variation in life satisfaction. And so one thing that we're interested in is, well, how much of this variation is due to stable factors uh, versus unstable factors? So we look at that using what are called starts models or starts analysis. And what this analysis does is it decomposes the variance in life satisfaction uh, into the proportion accounted for by uh, stable trait, with, which are stable, unchanging factors, something about the person that doesn't really change very much across the years. Um, how much of that variance is due to uh, slow changing factors? This is called the autoregressive trait. And how much of their life satisfaction report is just due to random momentary factors? So keep in mind, every month we're asking respondents to report their life satisfaction. So in any given month, Potentially, there's potentially some effects of their mood or some things that have happened that particular month that, is, that, that could influence their life satisfaction rating. So the, that would be the momentary states. And just to unpack uh, what we're trying to understand with these different components, uh, it could be, for example, it could be the case that all of the variation in life satisfaction is due to a stable trait. Now, if that were the case, you, you would get something that looks like this. So I'm plotting the trajectory of three people. And year to year, you would see no change in their life satisfaction. Um, so Meg would just be the, 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 sat the most satisfied person from year one all the way to year 10. Uh, and then you know the least satisfied person would be the same across those, those uh, 10 years. Um, another possibility is that all of the variation in life satisfaction rates are just random momentary. Um, month to month, year to year, you get no consistency in people's life satisfaction rating, which would mean that you find no differences between people in terms of their life satisfaction. So you might get something like this, lots of spikes up, up and down, no particular trend across time. The third possibility is that life, life satisfaction changes slowly, gradually. Um, so, so you see for some people, it might increase slowly over time. For other people, it might decrease slowly over time. So, so this would be evidence that life satisfaction is not perfectly stable, uh, but it's not random either. It's, it's sort of uh, changing in a way that might suggest that people are experiencing changes in their life circumstances, or they might be experiencing changes in habits that, um, that is causing life satisfaction to change gradually over time. Okay, uh, so, so these are just hypothetical possibilities. Um, in reality, when you look at the data, it's actually quite complex. And it's not really explained by any one of these components, but it's explained, uh, some proportion of it is explained by one component and, and some other proportion is accounted for by the others. So what we did is, in addition to looking at these components, is we asked ourselves, well, you know, we have all this data from 2015 to 2024. Um, why don't we why don't we carve out different slices of time from the data? So let's say we take one year of, of data and estimate these components. And let's say we take three years and we estimate the components again. And then finally, um, six years. Uh, how do the estimates change as we are observing life satisfaction over longer periods of time? Because that helps us sort of get a sense of how changeable life satisfaction is at different scales of time. Uh, and so these are the results. And just for now, I want to focus on uh, the, the one year 
uh, results. So you can see the the blue uh, part of the bars is the proportion of variance that is accounted for by stable trade. So within a single year, life satisfaction is pretty stable. About 60% of the variance in life satisfaction is due to this stable, um, you know, very difficult to change component. About 35% is due to the, this momentary state-like component, which is, you know, stuff that happened that particular month that is influencing how they feel about their lives. And only 7% is due to this autoregressive trait, um, which, which is sort of like more meaningful systematic change. Um, if we expand the observation from one year to three years and then six years, you can see that autoregressive component starts to increase. So, so over a longer period of time, we are better able to detect systematic, meaningful change in well-being. So in general, if we're interested in observing this kind of systematic change, not random change, but systematic change in life satisfaction, it seems pretty difficult to, to, to do this within a one-year period. Um, and I'm basing that on the, the autoregressive trait component, which only accounts for 7% of the variance in life satisfaction. Uh, so longer periods of time, maybe three years, maybe six years might be needed to, to verify more durable changes in life satisfaction. And one important implication of that is that for policies and interventions that uh, want to improve well-being in older adults, not just for a month or two months, but, but really create lasting change in well-being. Well, we really need to look beyond a single year to be able to detect these changes. Uh, and along with that, interventions and policies need to be thinking uh, about sustainability. Right, so so so, how do we create sustainable changes in well-being so that these positive changes in life satisfaction can eventually stabilize? Okay, that's it for my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Willem. Um, Arthur, please. Thank you very much for inviting me to uh, talk again at the uh, World Happiness Report Asian launch. Uh, it's uh, it's evening here, and so um, we're uh, ahead of the rest of the world. <laughs> um, it's uh, what I want to talk about is the importance of of free speech, and not just the importance of free speech, but really, if uh, countries change their um, degree of free speech, who gains within the country? Who gains the most? Um, and tying, tying this back to the World Happiness Report, we know um, for many years now, uh, perhaps since the very first report, the uh, explanation of factors that uh, explain happiness across countries. And one of the consistent findings in the World Happiness Report every year is that the freedom to make life choices is a very important aspect of explaining life satisfaction, whether it's the cantral ladder measure of life satisfaction or measuring positive effect or negative effect. Uh, the freedom to make life choices is absolutely uh, has a very large effect on life satisfaction uh, happiness overall. So one of the key aspects of uh, freedom of speech is the freedom to make life choices. And we uh, um, asked the question in our papers, a paper written with Diana Vorman Tam and Nicholas Watson, published recently. Um, you'll see the reference there. Uh, that we one of the key aspects of freedom to make life choices is freedom of speech. And the question that we ask is do people value free speech differently depending on their resources, income or education resources? Um, and so we can think of that in economic terms, is free speech a luxury good? Is it valued most by people at the upper end of the income or education spectrum? Or is it a necessary good and valued most by people at the lower part of the income or education spectrum? And in answering this question, we looked at uh, two, two aspects. One is stated preferences, when people are asked to rank the importance of free speech relative to other factors, 
um, how important, uh, how high a ranking do they give free speech? And we look at whether it's ranked first or second amongst a range of choices. And then we look at the revealed preference of how uh, changes in free speech across countries over time um, affects subjective well-being measured as life satisfaction of individuals. <clears throat> so bringing it back to the um, to the literature in, in subjective well-being. We use uh, life satisfaction measures from the World Values Survey over 40 years and also from the Latino Barometer um, uh, data set, which is a shorter time span but has a very um, more frequent coverage of, of countries and uh, a similar number of countries. Just to put it in context, if we look at the one of the measures of freedom of speech that we use, which is the VDEM measure from the University of Gothenburg in Sweden, um, the left-hand graph uh, plots the level of free speech measured between zero, um, which is a complete lack of free speech, to one, which is complete freedom of expression uh, the, um, in 2023. So we'll see um, for countries in East Asia and Oceania, uh, which are the countries that I have um, listed on the graph. Uh, some countries have free speech scores up around uh, point above 0. 0.9, between 0. 0.9 and 1, so especially Australia and New Zealand. Um, Taiwan ranks very highly. Japan ranks very highly, um, as does Papua and New Guinea. Um, and then, of course, we have some countries which rank very low, Cambodia, China, Laos, Myanmar, uh, Russia, and Vietnam. Uh, and if we look at changes, um, and my my um, apologies, these are changes from uh, twenty uh, from twenty these from two thousand and three through till twenty twenty three. So in other words, the change over the last twenty years, we see that Malaysia has had a significant increase or a major increase in uh, its freedom of expression, <clears throat> but almost every other country has he either been unchanged or in some country some cases such as Hong Kong and Russia in particular, very, very serious declines in the um, freedom of expression over that 20 year period. So, uh, and this is what we found overall on the data set, we have major changes in freedom of speech over our sample period. When people are asked to prioritize how important free speech is to them, um, tying it back to the, whoops, tying it back to the World Happiness Report theme this year, we see a very, very strong age gradient. So relative to people who are aged 15 to 24, um, uh, we find that there's less support or less yes, less support, less prioritization of freedom of speech as one gets older. Uh, so there's a very, very clear gradient there that it's young people who value freedom of speech the most. And as people get older, they value it less. Uh, when we look at employment status, it's the same thing. Students value freedom of speech very highly compared with employed or um, people not in the labor force. Then when we look at the question which we looked at in terms of resources, in terms of stated priority given to free speech, it seems that people who are well educated or high income have the give the highest priority to freedom of speech. And as um, incomes reduce or as uh, education reduces, there's less priority given to free speech. So if we ask people about the importance of free speech, it's the well-to-do and the educated that uh, prioritize it most along with the young people. However, when we look at the actual effect of free speech on subjective well-being, uh, here I don't have a nice pretty graph, but what we really find very, very clearly is that changes in freedom of speech in countries um, has the most impact on the subjective well-being for two groups. One is of course, those who prioritize free speech. So if you say free speech is important, then getting more free speech, uh, greater freedom of speech, um, it lifts your life satisfaction. But importantly, uh, increases in uh, free speech uh, increase the subjective well-being most of the more marginalized. So the less educated and lower income people benefit most in terms of their life satisfaction uh, from improvements in free speech, uh, freedom of expression. Uh, so this uh, is a really important uh, finding in, when it comes to uh, thinking about uh, regimes that restrict freedom of speech. Uh, restrictions of freedom of speech have the worst effect on those who are lower, have lower education or lower income. So just some con concluding thoughts. I think the World Happiness Report from the basis of our research is it's right to em emphasize the importance of freedoms. 
uh, and we can trace that back theoretically both to the to sense capabilities approach, which of course emphasizes the importance of opportunities and freedoms, and also to our findings now that subjective well-being is affected by freedom of speech as well. Uh, so the final concluding thought is that if governments wish to adopt a, uh, an approach, a policy approach to boost well-being, uh, and especially if they wish to boost the well-being of the most marginalized in these societies, then one of the things they should do is to prioritize uh, the importance of freedom of expression, free speech in their country. Thank you. Thank you very much, Arthur. Um, now, I think um, it's time for uh, some Q&A so we can collect some questions from the audience. And let's, uh, Barry will take over this part. Thank you, Shun. Hello, everybody. My name is Barry Grimes. I'm production editor for the World's Happiness Report. And um, so we have time for a few questions. And I'll start with a question from Prem. Why Finland is the happiest country for seven years? And why can other countries not follow their happiness lifestyle? So I think all of our panelists could potentially weigh in on this question. So maybe Shun, do you want to start us off? Well, yeah, because our chapter is always about the ranking. So people always ask, okay, what's going on in some countries and why they are so happy or they are not so happy. Well, Finland had been on the top for a couple of years. Um, well, uh, they must have done something right because at least according to our six factor model, we know that um, you know Finland has um, very good um, income level and health level. And in particular, they have uh, been very high in other you know, non-economic factors such as the social support, freedom uh, in their life choices. The perception of corruption was very low there. And they, they, they just feel they have the social support and they have a very high level of generosity. So it's like they are done right, at least in our um, main factors used to expand the, uh, the, the happiness score, happiness distribution across countries. But in addition to that, I remember a couple of years ago, we had one chapter uh, focusing on the, um, the European, uh, North, Northern European countries. They have like the, some, provide a lot of insights about that, such as they have, um, you know, social trust and uh, equality uh, across gender and also different social groups. And their government is super clean there and also effective. And also importantly, the, the inequality, income inequality is very low in our society. So people feel safe, you have the sense of belongings there. And um, you don't have uh, too much worry about their, uh, you know, when they become sick or, or when they become old. So those are the key factors, I think, make those countries are really um, on the top. Well, I, I think we can also get some ideas from our, our other co-authors and the panelists. Are there any other panelists who'd like to comment on this question? Uh, I can jump in uh, to say a little bit. Uh, we don't do a ranking for adolescents well being among different countries, but I would assume and guess Finland would be quite high in the adolescents well being ranking as well, because uh, we know that uh, the the Finland government have already incorporated um, well being intervention within their um, education curriculum. So, like, I would assume that that their students have already know the concept of concept of well-being and, to, and mental health um, from like really early years so that they probably able to take care of their well-being uh, a little bit earlier than probably the rest of the world. Um, yeah, the, this is just a little bit that I want to say. Thank you. Now, I'm keen to hear from William and Arthur um, for the kind of the Singapore and New Zealand perspective. Is Finland a country that you think that you're trying to emulate or do New Zealand and Singapore have their own kind of unique approaches? Maybe we start with William and then go to Arthur. I think Singapore, um, you know, the the government is very good about taking a look at what goes on around the world, what, what effective practices and policies there are. But there's always, uh, you know, there's always this understanding that you have to tailor things for the Singapore context. Um, because the country is, uh, smaller than other countries. And so it, you know, it has to be managed in a, in a certain way. It can't, 
you know, something might work well in Singapore or in the US or Europe, but, you know, when we think about trying to import that into the Singapore context, there's got to be some, you know, evaluation, some analyses, <laughs> um, a lot of discussion before, you know, to really understand what a, what what a, what practices and ideas can we can we actually um, you know really incorporate in a beneficial way in Singapore society. So uh, I would say the Singapore government is always keeping its eyes out and open, um, but it's never just a blind adoption of what's going on in other countries. Thanks, yeah, William and Arthur. Yeah, Barry. Um, and one of the challenges I think with some of these countries that score very highly is that um, a number of them are not very diverse societies. And uh, so if you look at Finland and Denmark, et cetera, like that, they seem to be um, very monocultural, a very, very small indigenous population, a very small number of immigrants. Um, and it's a challenge for those of us who who like the idea of diversity in multicultural societies, but we see these um, monocultural societies seem to be scoring very highly, um, and we know, for instance, in the in the literature that there's a greater support for social supports, social services, um, which often go to the less privileged um, in monocultural societies than there are in diverse societies, because in diverse societies. Um, the rich think, well, their support will go to people not like them, whereas in countries like Finland, uh, their support will go to people like them. So I think this does throw up a challenge to um, uh, multiculturalism and, and diversity, which um, coming from a very multicultural country, New Zealand, um, very, very, you know, 30 percent of our population is migrants. And uh, of course, we have a large indigenous population, a large Pacific population um, that we've many countries differ substantially from these Northern European um, enclaves. Wonderful, thank you very much. So I'm, I'm conscious we only have a, a couple of minutes left. Um, so I think at this point I will hand back to Shun, but we have recorded the other questions that have been submitted and I think we can compile some written answers for those um, after the call. Um, but at this point I will hand back to Shun just to, to wrap up the call and and do the final comments. Okay, um, yeah, actually we got uh, many more questions uh, there uh, and uh, I'm also trying to answer some of them. Uh, some of them. Um, well, um, thanks uh, for everyone's efforts. Um, we just uh, introduced what's going on in this year report. Of course, we cannot cover all the content there, but um, um, we do invite um, our audience to go to our website, worldhappiness.report, to read more details there. And uh, in this year, as we said, we focus mainly on the um, different age groups, in particular the children and old. And we can see that, uh, that there are a lot of differences in terms of happiness score and of rankings among different age groups. That means we cannot just uh, we shall not just look at their um, a national average. We should also pay attention to uh, different groups of the people in the society. Probably they are facing very different life circumstances. For example, um, in some countries, the old are very happy. For example, in the United States and China, they are doing well in their country. However, in the countries like um, Japan, oh, sorry, in Korea, their old people are not very happy there. So uh, different countries are facing different uh, situations. So and to you know, better get our public policy making. It's better to have a, a larger data set of, you know, data sets and on more details on each group of the uh, population so that we can, you know, design a better policies to improve their well-being. Well, um, but we can also see that we are facing some problem like a lack of data for um, for some uh, some groups of people, for example, um, the young people, actually, we are a lack of the data in, in Asia Pacific region. And um, I think there are a lot of, you know, uh, work um, uh, from the government or from international organizations to be done in the future to collect more information. Well, we are able to show this global rankings because we have those Gallup data, otherwise it's really difficult to do this. Um, it's difficult to know which countries are doing much better than others. And uh, in our analysis, we showed that, okay, some factors, not just the economic factors, but also some non-economic factors are very important, such as the freedom to make life choices. Actually, I got some interview from the Korean media. I always ask why Korea are not doing that well, even they are rich. 
And I mean, if you compare their, the six factor, we'll see that, okay, they're not doing very well, for example, in their perceived corruption. They're not that clean, you know, not as clean as Northern European countries or, or Singapore. And also more importantly, they have um, very low freedom to make life choices there. So it's like, and um, people are probably, their success were very narrow defined. It's very hard for them to achieve a different styles of success in our society. So. And uh, so that means there are a lot of things uh, are, are important in our life, which matter for our happiness. And we, we are really want to have, we really want to see more and more studies in the future. And so that's why in different years of World Health Report, we cover the different topics. We are trying to broaden our, uh, the horizon about the happiness studies. Um, and uh, due to the time limit, uh, we are not able to answer so many questions for you guys, but I do hope and you can send us emails if you're interested in some part of our presentation or some part of the study. We read the report and you can talk to us individually. Thank you very much. And thanks a lot for our panelists and uh, co-authors to join this event. I hope to see some of you guys or all of you guys in next year's Asian launch event. Thank you very much. And I think uh, due to time limit, we will just stop over here to, for today and uh, have a have a good day and a good night. Thank you everyone, bye-bye.